Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Please visit audiblepodcast.com slash gems for your free audiobook download. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 138. In the last episode, we took a big bite of food family history. And in today's episode, I've got part two of my interview on food family history with Gina Philibert Ortega. She's the author of From the Family Kitchen, Discover Your Food Heritage and Preserve Favorite Recipes. Now, you know what they say, the way to get to a man is through his stomach. Well, I think you could also say that the way to get to a genealogist is through their stomach, because I've received a slew of emails and messages from all of you out there about your culinary family history. It's been fantastic. Now, Alvi in Lakeland, Florida, who has written in before, uh, he wrote in to say, I was up at the crack of dawn and rode my bike around our favorite lake in Lakeland. While pedaling, I had my iPhone tuned into your podcast about family cookbooks. I was not blessed to know either one of my grandmothers. My mother's mother died shortly after her birth, and my father's mother died over five years before I was born. I have had many paternal aunts who were supreme cooks. So many of them cooked by being taught those tried and true recipes handed down for generations. I've watched my Aunt Martha cook and never saw her pick up a recipe. One of her favorite was buttermilk pie from Fresh Farm Buttermilk on their farm. And he asks a question. He says, would it be possible to share the recipe for the cookie? Was it a sour cream cookie? The one your husband loves. My wife loves to bake cookies to share, and she has all sorts of recipes, and folks rave about her cookies. He says, I will be going to a family reunion in Coleman, Alabama, the weekend before FGS. We'll get to dine on some of that delicious food at the Davidson White Reunion. Well, Alvi, you will find the sour cream cookie recipe that I talked about in the interview. It's at the bottom of a blog post that I did a while back called Family History Never Tasted So Good. You will see a picture there of my husband with his Nana when he was a little boy. And at the bottom of the post, uh, just click the image of the cookbook page and it will be large enough for you to read and and copy off if you would like. Uh, They are yummy. So try them out. And uh, here's an email from Tina. She says, I've been watching your video about the toast tight. I remember we had something similar, although it wasn't called a toast tight when I was growing up in Brazil, except that it was square, which kind of makes sense because the bread is square. And it made simply the best toasted cheese sandwiches ever. And when I went back to Brazil in the mid 1980s, you could still buy them. I wish I still had one. They were far better than the electric toasted sandwich makers that I bought later on. I love foodie memories. Ooh, Tina, me too. And, uh, you know, Tina's talking about the video that we did. Uh, Gina and I got together in the in my kitchen, and we were cooking with an, the old toast tight, uh, which my grandmother had back in the 1940s. Um, So if you haven't checked out the video, you got to check it out. And if you're a Genealogy Gems app user, you'll find it in the bonus content. We tucked it in there. Uh, But it's also on the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. Well, when Lacey and I were cleaning out the garage last weekend, and we were looking for some items that she might be able to use when she moves out on her own, and we came across a box of old kitchen utensils that I inherited from my maternal grandmother. And we opened up the box and... Lacey's like, oh, ick, this is old stuff. (laughs) But I just gasped because there, laying on the top, was yet another toast tight. Can you believe it? Since I just made up a fresh batch of peach jam, you guessed it, we made peach pudgy pies. They were so good. And my youngest daughter, Hannah, who is home right now from college on on a summer break, Well, her favorite snack in the world is cinnamon and sugar toast. That's just her thing. So I invited her into the kitchen the other day, and I showed her how to make a cinnamon and sugar toast tight. And she thought it was awesome. 
uh, I couldn't believe it. She even took a picture of herself with it, and she posted it on Facebook. So it had to be good, right? Now that I have two of them, she wants to take one of them back to college so that she can make them for her friends and her softball teammates. So um, I may have to let her take the second one with her. And in fact, she made dinner for us all the other night. She made pizza pudgy pies, okay? So she used, I think they were panini rounds is what she called them, but they were um, almost like a pita bread kind of a bread. She used the rounds and put tomato paste that were all, was all seasoned and shredded mozzarella and little tiny pepperonis and bits of olive and oh my gosh, it was heavenly, kind of like a pizza pocket, but it was a pizza pudgy pie with a toast tight. Who knew? She's all over it. Uh, she She's the cook of my daughters. So um, I know that she'll have fun with that. And um, how funny that they had them in Brazil. You know, and, and in a way, a square version makes a lot of sense because bread is square. But I have to say there is something kind of fun about when you press it together and the bread, um, the crust falls off. And it makes the perfect round shape. That's, I don't know, it kind of makes it special. Okay, this episode is making me hungry already. (laughs) Okay, let's get focused. Um, Let's see, Lori from Ridgefield, Washington. She wrote in to share a bit of her food family history. She says, I want to share with you a craft project that I created for my two grown sons. I didn't realize at the time what I created fit into the topic that you have discussed about how to get the family involved in history. At the time, I had not even created a family tree yet. As I'm sure you are aware, we pass down recipes within the family, and as um, folks grow up and move away, those tastes of home are often missed. It could be grandma's bread baking or an aunt's cookies, memories etched deep in our senses. Both of my boys have called me from the grocery store to ask how to cook a favorite dish. And this got me to thinking close to the holidays about making a homemade cookbook filled with family recipes. I scoured the old copy of the church fundraiser, a cookbook my mother-in-law submitted recipes to. Digging up more favorites from my recipe box and contacting family members asking them for favorite recipes along with any store that went with it. I then purchased blank cookbooks in a binder style, transcribed them into the computer as documents printed to PDF. Each recipe has its own page that lists the person's name and any story and tips. The gift turned out to be the highlight of the day and they poured over it and then I heard them talking about the food and memories. Now my boys tell me when I cook something new and very good, that's one for the book. (laughs) It has turned out not to be just a book on a shelf, but one that they often use. And Lori even sent in photographs of her cookbooks to share with all of you. So check them out. They're in the show notes for this episode. Just go to genealogygems.com, click podcast episodes, and click your way to episode 138. This is such a terrific idea. And I did some for my daughters a couple of years back. And uh, in fact, we were just talking about them the other day because one of them was like, where is that book? But what a neat idea. And the idea of not just giving them your recipes, but really fleshing it out as a family history legacy. That's really cool. And Carol in Flagstaff, Arizona, she wrote in to say, I have several interesting cookbooks pertaining to my history. One is The Joy of Cooking, published during World War II, which includes a section on meal planning during rationing. The other one is from a Norwegian Heritage Society in Seattle. And she goes on to ask, what would be good ways to share this information with other family historians? I could scan portions of the books. Well, First of all, Carol, the main thing is to check the copyright of the old books that you have and um, just do a Google search on um, copyright guidelines or reprinting guidelines. Um, There's a lot of good information out there on copyright. And in fact, if you're a premium member, we have a whole episode. I think we talked about copyright with Kath Madden Trindle early on in in the series of premium podcast episodes that are all part of premium membership. Um, But I think a great way to share them would be to blog about them. And if you want a quick and easy way to start blogging, all you got to do is watch. I have a free video series at the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel, How to Blog Your Family History. And you'll find that at YouTube, Y-O-U-T-U-B-E dot com slash Genealogy Gems. While you're there, click the subscribe button so you'll get the, the new videos that we put out on a regular basis. 
But if you look, there's a playlist. I think it's listed along the right-hand side of the page, and it's How to Blog Your Family History. Really easy to do, and of course, it's free. And you know, blogging is not only a great way to share information with your family and friends, but your articles will be searchable by Google. And that means you're out there sharing recipes and information about family history and cookbooks and other people who are interested in those same keywords and topics and families, they're going to be able to find you through Google search. That's really what the blog does for you is it not only um, captures it, and gets it out to your family, but then it be, kind of becomes distant cousin bait, if you will. You might pop up when they are searching on those same topics. They can read your blog. They can comment on it. You can even connect up. It's, it's a really uh, great and easy way to just get out there and share information and connect with other people who are researching the same families or the same subjects. You could also, of course, create a book where you uh, share the original recipes. You could do something like Lori mentioned, where um, maybe you take a, a scan to represent the recipe as it was in the Joy of Cooking book, and then you could make notations about how maybe you changed it or put your own spin on it. I think it's even fun to have a photograph of you cooking and preparing that dish. And um, maybe even a photograph um, of an old family kitchen or somebody else in your family who also tended to make that dish. Just whatever memories that you have, I think uh, would be wonderful in a a book. And you could use print on demand to create a book like that if you wanted to. Now, Lori talked about having a three ring binder type ready made um, cookbook that you just put everything in there. But you could go the option of print on demand. And I do have a series um, of podcasts. They were premium podcast episodes just on that topic, how to do print on demand for family history books. And certainly a food family history book falls in that line. And a couple of those episodes also have companion videos so that you can really watch me using the service on the computer screen because you create the book online right from your computer. It's quick. It's easy. And the great part is it's very affordable, and you really get a professional-looking book when you're done. The beauty of print-on-demand is that you only pay for exactly the number of books that you want. So there's no minimum order. Like in the old days, you had to print 500 copies of whatever the book was. A, A person could literally just order one single copy of the book if they wanted to. And, of course, if you use a print-on-demand service, then your family and friends who may want a copy for themselves or an extra copy to give to somebody else, they could buy it right from the print-on-demand website rather than you having to be the middleman, which I think is especially nice when you got folks who live across the country from you. You don't get bogged down trying to buy extra books and then ship them out to somebody else and exchanging money and all that stuff. It's a hassle. So, um... That might be an option as well. All right. Good luck on that project. And Sean absolutely cracked me up with his email. He says, I finally caught up on the Genealogy Gems episodes that were in my queue yesterday. Excellent and inspiring as always. Thank you very much, Sean. But in the latest episode, I wonder if your dog is a cousin of Doug from the movie Up because he was completely silent until your guest said the word squirrel. And, oh my gosh, I think Sean is right, okay? And I say in the video, okay, I'm here in our kitchen and my dogs are here, so they might bark. And they were. They were totally quiet. It is so funny. We have three dogs, which, of course, was not the plan. (laughs) But you know how things go when you have kids who get a dog. You know, they're away at college, they get a dog, and the next thing you know, they graduate and you have an extra dog now, too. Well, anyway, we have a really big backyard with um, trees and there's one squirrel that lives just out there and I think it just lives to torment my dog Howie and Lacey's dog Dakota now Howie is the one that you hear in the video who would just bark like crazy that's so funny he did it at the moment that I think Gina was talking about squirrel it was a recipe for cooking squirrel or something sometimes you know I'll just be walking by the back sliding glass door in the kitchen family room And I can see Dakota way out there at the corner of the yard. And she's just sitting for hours under this one tree, frozen in place, looking up at this squirrel. And the squirrel just sits there, just high enough to be unreachable. 
and chatters at her, just torments her. And poor Coda thinks she's got a chance, and I don't think she does. So (laughs) it's funny. But that is funny that you caught that. Anyway, Sean goes on to write. Uh, He says, but really, I enjoyed the episode, and it got me thinking of our cookbooks. I've got a recipe box that came to us via my wife's grandmother that I'll be taking a closer look at this weekend. And for me, my first cookbook was a copy of The Joy of Cooking. There it is again. He says that my parents bought for me when I first left for college. Although as the family chef, I haven't made a lot of markings in it yet. We have pressed many leaves and flowers within wax paper between the book's pages. And several of the leaves and flowers are still there. But now with our 20th wedding anniversary tomorrow, oh, congratulations, Sean and his wife. Uh, He says, I'm going to take some time with Jennifer to see if we can identify where and when those artifacts were saved. You know, Sean, I think it would be really great if you started making notes in the margins, like that a recipe is someone's favorite dish or the first time you remember making it. I think we could all do a little more to uh, share those food memories with our descendants. We should be doing that too, huh? Okay, well, I've had such a wonderful time hearing from all of you about your food memories and your family history. And uh, coming up right after this, we are going to check back in with Gina Philibert Ortega for part two, the final part of my interview with her on culinary family history. It's here, the new version 5 of the award-winning Roots Magic genealogy software. It makes researching, organizing, and sharing your family history easier and more enjoyable than ever. If you're looking to take the next step in your family history research and start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database, or if you've really been wanting to make a switch to a much more user-friendly program, then do what I did. I chose Roots Magic, and I'm really glad that I did. Throughout its 10-year history, Roots Magic has helped people research and share their family trees with innovative features like uh, moving people from one file to another with your mouse, a source wizard to help you document your work, creating a shareable CD to give to family and friends, and running Roots Magic off of a USB flash drive when you're away from home. Roots Magic also received the award for easiest to sync from Family Search for their work in interfacing with that system. Really, what are you waiting for? Download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 5 at rootsmagic.com. See why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. I want to take this moment to thank our special sponsor for this episode, and that's Audible. Audible is the Internet's leading provider of spoken audio entertainment. They have over 40,000 titles to choose from. If you have a genre that you like, they have it covered. If you go right now to audiblepodcast.com slash gems, you can get yourself a free audiobook download when you sign up for the service. And if you're wondering which book to get with that free audiobook download, how about A History of English Food by Clarissa Dixon Wright, who will take you on a journey from the time of the Second Crusade and the feasts of medieval kings to the cuisine of the present day. She gives a vivid sense of what it was like to sit down to the meals of previous ages in an insightful and thoroughly entertaining way. This is a magnificent tour of nearly a thousand years of English cuisine, peppered with surprises and seasoned with Clarissa Dixon Wright's characteristic wit. A History of English Food is just one of about 40,000 audio titles to choose from. Get started with your free audiobook by going to audiblepodcast.com slash gems. In this gem, I'm going to welcome you back to the warmest room in the house, the kitchen. 
here amongst the pots and pans, we're going to meet back up with my friend, Gina Philbert Ortega, author of the book, From the Family Kitchen, Discover Your Food Heritage and Preserve Favorite Recipes. Now, in the last episode, number 137, we talked about old cookbooks, where to find them, and what they can tell you about your family history. In this final part of the interview, I get to turn the table on Gina a bit and ask her some of the food family history questions that she encourages her readers to ask in their families. So here's part two of my conversation with Gina. Let's see here. Um, chapter six. Okay. You were talking about how to go about interviewing um, people in your family about okay. your culinary history. Yeah. So let me ask you some of your own questions. Okay. Mine's probably not as exciting. <laughs> what was the first meal you ever prepared? That's a good and one. And see, they oh. are thought provoking. Okay, that is a good one. Okay, I was in 4 H for a little bit. And uh, where I lived wasn't real rural. So the 4 H was mostly cooking and stuff like that. And, and so I think my mom thought that was a good idea. So she sent me off to 4 H. But um, I will tell you speaking of Jello, uh, they had a competition. And so I was going to make my mother's famous Jello salad. Which is basically, here's the secret recipe, and I've published this anyway. We call it pink stuff. I know other people call it something else, but it's basically dry jello, cool whip, right? And you can put in mandarin oranges or whatever and cottage cheese. So you put all that together and you mix it until the jello is, you know, uh, no longer granular. And um, that was what I went and you know, um, showed my best and the judges did not like it. <laughs> so, Aww. um, that was the end of my 4-H career, but I did make several meals out of 4-H. But what was funny is that, um, the 4-H teacher was teaching us all these shortcuts like shake and bake and stuff. And my right. mother just thought that was terrible. Like they weren't really teaching us how to cook. So, yeah. so that's probably the first meal. Interesting. Okay. Now, what did you eat at your grandparents' house? And was it different than what you ate at your house. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. You know, uh, my maternal grandmother had a huge garden. And so we actually would have, in fact, she made zucchini strips, not fried, just raw, mm-hmm. and ranch dressing, and that oh. was weird to us. Yeah. So, um, so we got to eat a lot of fresh vegetables, and we actually, she was... Um, composting long before people composted so that was kind of exciting for us for some reason and then at my paternal grandparents house one of the things my grandmother made that i love is pickled eggs oh and she pickled them with beet juice and which is a little little different yeah a little sweet and it turns them obviously purplish red (laughs) yeah Yeah. so so yeah and you know she made chicken dumplings and stuff like that that we did not eat at home Mm -hmm. so um so definitely it was much more exciting at other people's houses (laughs) (laughs) i wonder now what nationality was the grandmother making the pickled you know, what's funny is people have told me that that is Pennsylvania Dutch, and she is not Pennsylvania I was thinking Dutch. German. Yeah. yeah. And uh, she does have German, so it might be her grandparents were German. That might be what it was. Mm-hmm. So, um, unfortunately, you know, all my grandparents died when I was in my early 20s. And so, you know, all those questions I could have asked them. Yeah, I didn't get to. So, but I'm sure it must have been a German thing. And it's interesting because my great grandparents were German. They immigrated in 1910, and I didn't put it together until years later that my mother used to make um, cabbage rolls. Oh, sure, cabbage rolls and sauerkraut. I love sauerkraut. I couldn't stand either one, and I would just look at her. What are you doing? Yeah, no mother makes that. that. Yeah. <laughs> Now I realize, oh, okay, this comes from her maternal line and the the German cooking. So, and it's funny because I think my tastes now, later in life, are actually turning back to vinegar. Isn't that funny how it changes? Yes. Well, I love sauerkraut and it's good for you too. So, yeah. 
cleans out the the uh, helps <laughs> passageways, your helps your right. stomach. Have you ever raised your own food, either growing up or today? You know, I have had a garden. Uh, in fact, at one point when we lived in our other house, I had an artichoke plant, and those are always fun to raise. Mm-hmm. So I have never raised animals, though, for food. Not not much of that in California unless you live in a really rural area. And I had chickens here in the backyard. Oh, did okay. I did for several years, and um, we didn't roast the chickens, although I heard okay. all kinds of stories about my grandmother, you know, twisting the neck, and yeah. they were done. But um, we did them for eggs, and I have to say the eggs were oh, so much better. Oh, I my bet. gosh. I bet they were. Yeah. My mother, actually, they had chickens and rabbits, and uh, they even ate pigeon once, and so, yeah, but... At our house, we did not do that. But that's funny that you mentioned artichoke because I had I've had artichokes in the backyard, and um, that shows your California roots, doesn't it? It does, and I love artichokes. And I'll tell you, those are hardy plants. And there are people who've never had an artichoke. That's right. That's right. And they're basically a thistle. They are. They're hardy. They they're are. like a weed. And and yeah. And if you let them go, they have a purple flower, and it's really beautiful. Yeah. So uh, that can happen. But yeah, my husband actually tried to destroy it and mowed over it several times, <laughs> and it still came up. No, they come back. Although that's I right. found that the ants absolutely adore they love them. them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only bad part about that. Yeah, All right. Well, and and the other big question I wanted to ask because it it really caught my eye in the book was, um, did you go out to dinner very often when you were young? Because the whole idea of dining out is um, very common in some families, rather foreign in others. And I know for us, boy, if we were going out to dinner, my first question was, oh, is grandma in town? You know, because it was a big deal. Yeah, and I'll tell you, when I was writing about that, that was a hard thing for me to write about because we did not go out to eat. And um, I remember maybe as a teenager going to places like Carl's Jr., and stuff like that, but we did not go out to eat often. Well, it was considered to be very frugal. You could literally cook cheaper at home. You know what's funny? I find nowadays, I find that sewing at home, which I love to sew, cooking at home, oftentimes I can't do it at the same price that I could just go out and pay for it. Yeah, and you know, I when I thought about the restaurant portion and menus and that kind of thing, you know, I kept thinking, well, how many people really got to go out? But there, it, it really matters what your situation was in life. Mm-hmm. We did not because we didn't have the money. Um, and I don't, I mean, obviously there were restaurants where we lived, but um, there but wasn't a lot of fast corner. food. They weren't on every corner. And it was a rare treat to go out. I don't even know that we went out for our birthdays most yeah. of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know that, you know, when you look at beautiful menu collections from uh, New York Public Library, L.A. Public Library has them. Both of those places have them online that people have been going out and, and enjoying you know, restaurant food since the 1800s. Mm-hmm. And so obviously when you travel, and that's probably when we ate out too is when we travel to my grandmother's house. But um, so I know that it just, you know, everything depends on your situation. And that's really what I wanted to get in the book is that it's not so much about what I did because we didn't do all those things. I wanted to really get a little bit of what a lot of people's experiences are, you know, um, and that was the great thing about NGS is people coming and telling me about their experience, which was quite foreign from mine. And so I really want to reflect that and give people who come from lots of different backgrounds, you know, some ideas about what their family could have done food wise. And and that is really key. And that's what comes out, I think, as you go through the book is that there were so many different experiences. And in a way, you really can't fully appreciate how diverse your ancestors were until you explore their culinary history. Um, because it, it is such a shocker because you'll talk to somebody and they'll say, you guys never went out to eat? Yes. What? Oh my gosh, it was Saturday night. We always went out. Yeah. And it was interesting because in one of my eBay searches that I had set up um, on my husband's grandfather's ship, the Tunisian, the SS Tunisian, and he came over in 1912, one of the alerts that came back one time was a set of menus from the ship itself. Sure. sure. And uh, that was interesting to me because he was one of the few ancestors who did not come in steerage. He came first class. Yeah. And so it was really interesting to see what they were serving on board. Oh, isn't that wonderful to see those things? Yeah. Yeah, you know, people have diverse experiences, and sometimes we get so used to our own that we don't think about that. But that really, as 
prior to writing the book, from reading all those cookbooks and just um, talking to people about the food their families ate, I really got that experience. I mean, one of the best times I had at a speaking engagement was for an Italian genealogy society. And it was right before Easter, and they all talked about what their families made for Easter. And let me tell you, it was way different than what our family had for yeah. Easter. And you know, they, in fact, in some cases, they didn't even know what the dish was called because, you know, this is when they were kids and, and that kind of thing. But the descriptions of the food and stuff was amazing and it totally different. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted people to, you know, think about that and start looking for how different their, their female ancestors' lives were. Mm -hmm. You know, about, um, Oh, gosh, 10 or 20 years ago, I remember sitting down one afternoon and closing my eyes and trying to take a visual tour of my maternal grandmother's kitchen, where yeah. I spent a lot of time over the years. And it was amazing, if I gave it some time, how so many really minute details came back. Everything from really how small that kitchen was. Yeah. Oh, they were in a tiny little house that they had built. And um, that the fact that the, the garage door was there and that the stove stood alone, which in our house it was built in. But I realize now it stood alone because it did not come with the stove when they originally no. built the house. And the number one thing I remember was wheat checks and check cereals kept under the sink which my mother just thought was just awful, and she changed immediately when she got her own house, and those bright, jewel-colored tin cups. Did you ever have those? No. And they would clink on your teeth, but they were very 40s. Yeah. Tell us about one, yeah. one of your grandmother's kitchens. You know, um, I can visualize my maternal grandmother's kitchen as well, and what was funny about that kitchen, you know, it was painted um, kind of one of those 40s greens, mm -hmm. you know, and um, it was a really big room because there was the kitchen part and then, you know, the the table and everything, the dining room was part of it. Right. But what was funny about her kitchen was, now, I'm not sure who built the cabinetry. My grandmother, I'm not that tall, but my grandmother was. The sink was real. It was made for people who are really short, and she I had to bench. <laughs> yeah, she had to lean over. You know, she would have us kids do it because obviously it was fine for us. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really, really short, and I think that must have been horrible for her. And you know, she, I, I can see the little meat grinder. You know, I don't know if any of your grandmothers had oh, that, yeah. but the little meat grinder, and um, you know, it just. The other thing she had that we don't have here in California is she had a basement. Right. And um, she had food down there that I swear to you looked like it had been down there for 50 years. <laughs> and so I was always afraid that we'd have to eat that food because it didn't look that fresh to me. Yeah. Yeah. And who knows? She may have had a real rotating system of, of her preserving. She, but She probably did. Oh, yeah. I know. I, in fact, um, in my studio office is my, my grandmother's green pie safe um, that I remember being in that garage that was just off the kitchen and it was always filled with preserves. And it's funny because, um, I don't know if I should say you, feel, you should feel honored, today is the day that Suncrest peaches come out in Brentwood. Oh. But I'm not going, which I'm always there on the first day <laughs> because I'm interviewing Dina. Nice. But my husband was like, you're missing launching day at the Suncrest Peaches, but I love going out in the fields. I'm going to take my little grandson, Davey, this year. But I, it just brings back so many memories of apricot jam and peach jam in that pie safe, sitting out there, getting dusty, yeah. but yes. in the garage. Yes. Yeah, and you always wonder, well, how, how many years can that sit there? But we ate it, yeah. so I know it moved. It, it rotated. Yeah. Well, and that basement, you know, it had the creaky stairs, yeah. and it was really dark down there, and so she would send us down there, and I was always afraid I would be, you know, meet some horrible fate down there, because it just seemed so... And it was probably cooler, so... Was it was her? cooler, it was nicer, mm -hmm. and, you know, once in a while there was a little window, and the cousins would be outside laughing at you, or, you know, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, but... <laughs> Well, again, the book is called From the Family Kitchen. And um, 
tell us just to kind of bring it to a close, what are you hoping that, that your readers get from this book? Well, one of the things that I hear a lot is either that people don't like researching female ancestors or that they just find it way too difficult. And so the two things that I hope this book does is one, I want people to think of new ways or see new ways that they could bring some life into the stories of their female ancestors and really take them from Mrs. So-and-so to much more than that. The other thing is, is I think about, you know, we get really frustrated not being able to find information, but then I wonder how much information are we leaving behind? Yeah. And so... The second part of that is I want people to be inspired to start leaving behind some of their, you know, recipes and and their memories and pictures. And, you know, like you, I wish I had a picture of my grandmother's kitchen, and I don't think I do. Mm -hmm. No one ever thought to take a picture of it. And now I would love to have that picture. So I really want to, you know, hopefully inspire people to not only think about the past, but think about the future and the memories of their children and grandchildren. Um, so that they have something how different the kitchen might look in 25 years. I mean, oh. when I think about, um, I still have the tile with the grout on the countertops. And people, you know, you watch these TV shows and these young gals walk in these new homes. They're going to think about buying the grout. Oh, well, there's no granite. So, you know, That's as right. if, oh my, this is so archaic. And we had yeah. tile was an upgrade. So can you imagine how different k- kitchens will be? Well, and the other thing is, is things that we take for granted today in 25, 30 years, people may not even know what that is. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, when you think about, when I think about World War II and people using rationing stamps, a lot of people today have no concept right. of what that was like. And so I just think that the more we preserve for our future, it's going to be easier for them to retell our stories as well. So, you know, that's that's another thing that I really want out of the book is, you know, let's remember our female ancestors, even if it was only a generation or two ago, because, you know, what you know today, your kids may not remember. So, and then also let's leave behind that legacy as well. I love that idea. You know, I was thinking about that. My grandmother is my grandson's, you know, great, great. I mean, it doesn't take very long to be talking about great greats. And ha- oh my gosh, can you imagine if we had our great 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 grandmothers' recipes or pictures of their kitchen or ideas about how they lived? And and that is exactly what we could do for our own grandkids and our great grandkids. It is, you know, and this isn't about a woman, but I knew someone whose husband died and he died fairly young. He was in his 50s, and so they did not have grandchildren anymore. And I gave a talk once where I talked about, you know, how to not only do genealogy, but preserve some of those other memories. And she was saying that it really struck her that if she didn't write something about her husband, that within a generation, his memory would be gone, basically. And so I think we need to think about that, that, you know, people get busy and, and, you know, I ask my kids about stuff. They tell me they've never been somewhere or they haven't done something. I said, sure, we did that five years ago, and they have no memory of that. And so if we want to be remembered and past our generation, we need to leave those things behind and tell those stories. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you for giving us one of those tools to get there. There's even little recipe cards in the back and downloadable recipe cards. There's downloadable recipe cards, and so that makes it nice that you can – you know, save your recipes however you want. And obviously, there's a scrapbookish kind of component because it allows you to paste in pictures. Or you may try to do some other tool like an online cookbook or scrapbook designer. So, right. Well, it's from the family kitchen. Discover your food heritage and preserve favorite recipes. Gina Philibert Ortega, thank you so much. Nice to have you here at the house. Well, thank you for having me. had so much fun getting together. It was really fun that she was able to come by the house and chat 
with me and with all of you. If you would like a copy of Gina's book, I've got a link for you in the show notes, of course. And we always have the Amazon search box on the Genealogy Gems homepage for you. So when you buy books through the Amazon links or any of the links on the website, of course, you are making it possible to continue to bring the free Genealogy Gems podcast to you. So thank you very much for your support. I really hope that you've enjoyed this look at family history and food and that it's inspired you to rummage through the back of your cupboards and ask around the family for those recipes, cookbooks, memories, and even old cooking utensils so that you can bring your family's culinary history back to the forefront and preserve it like a ball jar of good peaches. And one last little gem for you. If you've enjoyed reminiscing about the food of days gone by, I want to recommend a video series to you that I have enjoyed for years. It's called Clara Cooks, and I've added a few of my favorite episodes of that series to my food and family history playlist at the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. You really got to check it out. Clara is in her 90s, and she talks about Depression-era cooking and what it was like when she was growing up. Just go to youtube.com slash genealogy gems scroll down you'll find the playlist um, food family history in the column on the right hand side of the page in that playlist you'll also find of course my video interview with Gina and our little cooking in the cook kitchen segment Clara Cooks is just a wonderful sweet video series and she shares some really good simple recipes so bon appetit Profile America, Wednesday, August 15th. Today marks the birthday of one of America's most beloved authorities on food, Julia Child, who didn't take a cooking lesson until she was in her 30s. When her husband was assigned to Paris, she fell in love with French cooking and wrote the first of several important cookbooks demystifying that nation's culinary art. The books led to a television show of several decades and many awards, including the French Legion of Honor and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Her kitchen is now part of the collection of the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. At one point, Julia Child said, Cooking is not a chore, it's a joy. A philosophy shared by many of the 337,000 chefs and head cooks across the nation. You can find more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. Well, before we wrap up this episode, I want to share one more quick gem that I got from Kat. She left this for me on Facebook, on the Genealogy Gems Facebook fan page. And we've been talking about how Facebook has changed how often you see the pages that you like, right? So if you go into uh, Facebook and you look up Genealogy Gems, you'll find that we have a specific page where we put all kinds of great content and information all week long, every week. And the problem is, is that now Facebook is trying to, I guess, make some money more so with advertising and promoting Facebook fan pages. And so when you do like a fan page like ours, you don't always get it in the newsfeed, which is kind of odd because you've already kind of indicated to Facebook, hey, I'd like to hear from this particular group on a regular basis. So anyway, I was talking about how there might be ways to get around that a little bit. And Kat says, I just listened to the podcast that was talking about adding pages to your news feed up in the like button option, which you can hover on the like button. And there's some options there. And she says, I'm not convinced that your feed stays visible with just saying show it in the news feed since Facebook is constantly changing things. But she has another tip for seeing pages on Facebook. So she says, on your home page of your news feed, on the far left-hand column, you'll see pages and groups that you've recently visited. So if you hover your mouse over that address, a little edit icon pops up, and then you can add that page or group to your favorites. These favorites stay pinned to your left column in Facebook. And when people make comments or the page updates, a little number shows up next to that page link letting you know, so in case it doesn't show up in your newsfeed, you know that there's stuff going on over there. 
So she has said uh, that she hoped that that helps some of the, you guys out there, and I, I hope that it does. Thank you so much, Kat. Uh, Facebook is changing all the time, and I know lots of you were on Facebook and enjoying it, and I certainly uh, love it when you join us over at the Genealogy Gems fan page. We've got good stuff for you. We're beefing that up over there. You can even listen to the podcast from the fan page now. Did you know that? <laughs> While you're surfing on Facebook. So anyway, you guys have great gems. Thank you so much, Kat. And thanks to Gina Philibert Ortega for being my guest here on the show. And thanks to you for listening and just taking time out. I know it's probably been a busy summer. It's been hot, um, but it's always a joy to talk with you. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.